All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's get started with today's lesson. Um, I've got a lot of scriptures to cover. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine scriptures I'd like to maybe get to this morning. Um, it's not it's, it's not something that we're going to cover in just one session. I'll do the rest of it next week. Uh, we're still talking about some of our responsibilities as uh, children of God, as, as kingdom people. We do have responsibilities. It's not just uh, beginning to rethink and reevaluate our, our theology, our doctrine, our way of thinking about salvation. Uh, it's not just uh, trying to get people saved in, in hopes that they'll endure the trials of the world and the trials that the flesh brings and someday make it to heaven. There's, there's more to the victorious life. There's more to this um, life that God, that, that Jesus called life more abundantly than just uh, walking down, running down, kneeling at an altar, uh, answering a call, a salvation message, and uh, repeating a prayer. And then, and like I said, in hopes of uh, someday making it to heaven. You know, let me just say this ahead of time. For people misunderstand me, I think that uh, the salvation prayer, the, uh, the salvation message is, is very important, and I believe that everybody who has repeated a prayer um, will eventually make it to heaven. We, you know, they're they're promised that. That's the promise of the word. But what what are we supposed to do? What 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 are we supposed to do with commandments like "Occupy till I come"? Uh, what are we supposed to do like? Jesus commanded uh, or, or taught the disciples to pray that kingdom come that will be done is the kingdom already here you know um, Jesus says that the kingdom is, 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 is at hand he said that the kingdom was within you and then he again he taught the disciples to pray that the kingdom come well is the kingdom coming or is the kingdom here and like I always like to, to tell you guys the answers to all my questions is yes Kingdom is here, and the kingdom is coming. Um, there's a there's a, a phrase that I heard many many years ago that I totally agree with. Theologians use it, um, is, and that's this: already, but not yet. Already, but not yet. Already, we are walking in the kingdom. What does what does Psalm um, Psalm 15, verse 16, what's that mean when, when, when the psalmist said that the heavens are the heavens of the earth, but the earth has been assigned to man? That, that word really means, uh, uh, the, the Hebrew word asad, which means assigned. Um, I think many translations say that the heavens are the heavens of the earth and the world, and the world has been given to man, or has been, uh, man has been given the charge of the earth. We're going to look at, look, look at some of those things. What is our responsibility when it comes to the earth? Um, at the risk of uh, sounding like I'm a tree hugger and a squirrel kisser, which I'm not, um, I'm going to give you some of the things out of scriptures that tell us or that uh, show us, illustrates for us, commandment, commands us, and shows us our responsibility of what we should do with this with this earth. Are we just supposed to say, you know, yeah, let's get as many people on this earth saved and to hell with all the earth. It's going to be burned up. It's going to melt away anyway. You know, so you know, the earth has no, you know, the, the earth has no value. The, the the earth has, you know, it's not going to be around very long. But so there's some things that we need to rethink. There's some verses that we need to revisit and really try to find out what. The Bible was trying to get across to us. Is the earth supposed to be redeemed? Is, is the earth supposed to um, to be part of this kingdom living? I, I, I believe it is. I believe that we have a responsibility when it comes to the earth. And we're going to read a lot of scriptures before I, before I, I, I because I want to set a base. Um, if you want to do yourself a favor, I was going to say do me a favor, but... Actually, it doesn't matter to me. You're not doing me a favor if you do this or not. You're doing yourself a favor. Um, jot down these verses and go back to them after the lesson. I think you heard this lesson. So write them down on a piece of paper and go back and study them. And, and, and um, 
see how they compare with other scriptures. So a lot of these scriptures we'll be reading will be out of the Old Testament. It's that, in fact, one, two, three, four, four of them. The fifth one I already quoted, Psalm 15. But um, five of them are out of the Old Testament. And then I'm going to have one, two, three that are going to come out of the New Testament. So we're going to try to try to see how they how they relate to each other how how what what was said in the Old Testament is carried on to what is said in what uh, the Apostle what Jesus was teaching in fact in the New Testament last week we talked about the pruning how God is cleaning you got the, 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 the word in John 15 when uh, Jesus was talking to the disciple and, and when he said that you are clean because of the word I have spoken it's the same Greek and the Greek it's the same word that is used for pruning God uses, and I use the illustration of the clippers and the, the hedge trimmer and eventually the chainsaw, uh, about how God has to use certain um, measures to, to prune us of ideas that we have, of thoughts that we have, of, of stuff that comes out of our mouth that reveals our heart. Um, so we're going to visit John 15 again in a little different light. You have been given, we have been given great responsibility, and that responsibility has been given to us, has been entrusted to us by the Lord. He trusts us this much. Um, I've been saying for years, a lot of us don't have a faith issue. You really don't need a lot of faith. Contrary to what we've been taught for decades and decades by the Word of Faith people, we, you really don't need a lot of faith. Jesus says if you had faith, the size of a mustard seed. If you ever notice in the gospel, Jesus always, always responded to people's needs, no matter how small a faith or how big a faith or how much faith they had. Whether they had little faith, whether they had no faith. You know, there's different levels of faith. One day I'm going to teach you the different levels of faith. Not right now, I don't want to get into it. I'll go off into the little rabbi trail that I want to go down. If we go down that trail, we'll never come back today. So I don't want, but there are different levels of faith. But Jesus always responded, always ministered, always gave answers to people, no matter what, how much faith they had, or how much faith they didn't have. It didn't matter to him. A lot of people, a lot of people through the years have told me, well, I don't have enough faith or I don't have the faith for that and I, my response is always well since when has your faith limited God so faith is important but faith is something that that that, that um, we get from God it's a gift from God first Corinthians teaches that about the gifts that we have so we're gonna we're gonna look about uh, at, at some of those things and and, and um, how our faith involves some of the things, some of the charges. If the heavens are the heavens of the earth and the earth he is assigned to man, then what are we supposed to be doing to the earth? Um, I hope you learned something last week. If you watched the lesson, if you didn't, I, I encourage you to go back because I'm going to be uh, saying some things. And I also want to piggyback on what Pastor Kevin was preaching on Sunday morning service. I, I recorded the, the Sunday school lesson last Saturday at 1 o'clock. And uh, Pastor Kevin preached the sermon that he preached on Sunday morning. He had not listened to my Sunday school lesson prior to him preaching the, the, the sermon um, on people ought to pray. We have a responsibility to pray. Remember when Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple? He premeditated that. And he drove them out and he said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. The little Aramaic translation of that, he said, My house, my father's house shall be full of prayer. Hello. I'll go ahead and um, put a plug in for this. I shouldn't have to, but I feel the need to. Um, Every second and every Saturday of the month, we have prayer in the sanctuary. 
from 6 until 8, sometimes we go a little bit longer. I encourage you to come. I encourage you to meet people. The Bible says, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in your midst. If two or more of you agree on something, and a few of us have been coming faithfully, and we'd like to have even more to agree with us. Some of the, we we got to speak against this coronavirus. We have to, together, corporately, we have to uh, uh, add, uh, add, add to each other's faith, add to each other's agreement when it comes to this coronavirus thing. And I'm not going to get into all the stuff that they're saying, that, you know, just the recent stuff. Um, let me just say this. I hope I can get back to what I was saying, but let, let me say this about that say this about that um, if you have a we encourage people to hear to hear from God what are you going to do about this coronavirus thing this, this virus is, that is that is out there I, I have my opinions I'll hold them I'll keep them to myself um, but if you if you have heard from the Lord if you if you have a, a word from the Lord then you need to obey you need to obey what God says. If God has told you, don't go over there, you know, don't meet on Sunday mornings, and, and, and the Lord has given you, then that, that's fine. The Lord has given you a word. You have to obey that word. And we have no, those that decide, okay, we are going to come and meet corporately on Sunday mornings, um, shouldn't be pointing a finger uh, and, and, and looking down on people because they decide, and accusing them of doing it out of fear. Let me say this, if you have a word from God and you're responding in obedience to the word of God, the fear is not involved. It wasn't fear that, 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 that it, it wasn't out of fear that Joseph and Mary fled into Egypt because Herod was killing two-year-olds and younger. They had a word from God. The angel appeared and says, go to Egypt. They're trying to kill the child. I'm so glad that Mary and Joseph didn't put on their charismatic thinking and their charismatic spiritual look and say, no, nah, no, nah, we're not going to run. We're not going to hide out of fear. We're going to stand on Psalm, Psalm 91. I'm so glad they didn't do that. I, they had a word from the Lord and they went and they hid. It wasn't out of fear. It was out of obedience. And that's what I'm saying to you. If you have a word from God, you know, when the children of Israel... Right before God, on on the on the day of Passover, when right when God was getting ready, the, the night before they were they were freed from slavery from the slavery of the Egyptians, they they were told to hunker down in their house behind the blood. And I'm so glad that they didn't stand there and say, you know what, I, I, nothing that nothing no weapon that formed against me will prosper. So. You know, the, the death angel, because you know, I'm saved, I'm delivered, I'm healed, but you know, I'm blessed and favored, and you know, highly favored. And all, you know, then he starts quoting all these scriptures and stuff like that. And, and, and I'm standing on faith, and then I'm, you know, I'm not standing in fear, and I'm going to go outside my door. If you, if you, if you were born, a, a firstborn son, you would have been dead. It wasn't out of fear that they stayed behind the blood. They had a word from God. Moses told them, "Here's what God says, and you better do it. Because if you, you because you, if you're a firstborn and you're firstborn, we'd be killed. All your cattle's firstborn, everybody, everything. I don't know. I don't know if you ever noticed what he was doing. He was setting them up. He was getting them, get them, getting them ready." So that they can acquire all the wealth of the Egyptians. He was preparing them for them to be healed. All of them. The Bible says that when they, when they went into the wilderness, there was not one feeble and not one sick among them. Because they obeyed the word of the Lord. They, didn't, they weren't doing that out of fear. They, they had a word of the Lord and they obeyed the word of the Lord. So what I'm saying about all that is that God is preparing you. And we're going to talk a little bit about how, when we read in John 15, if we get to John 15 today, um, we're going to talk about how God is preparing His people for abundance um, and finances, abundance in, um, in resources, 
and abundance and health, just like he was doing the children of Israel. If they had not obeyed the word of the Lord and hid behind the blood and, and stayed behind the blood, they would not have experienced those things. The disobedient, one, disobedient ones would not have experienced those things. So in, in this day that we are, that God is t testing our patience, really, I mean, he's, t he's been testing mine, can't go anywhere. I, I have a grandson that was born the first of the year I haven't seen other than videos that my daughter sends me. He lives in Houston. There's no way I'm traveling to Houston right now. There's no way. Put everybody in jeopardy, my family, my co-workers, my church, the kids at the school. There's no way I'm going to do that. So God is teaching me patience. God is teaching me how to obey His Word. God is teaching me wisdom. God expects you to, God expects you to react to His Word out of wisdom and out of obedience and never out of fear. So don't, don't let anybody tell you, oh, you're just in fear because you don't want to go to the restaurants and you don't want to go to the bank and you don't want to go to the mall and you know you don't want to go to the Walmart and you don't want to go to church. That's just a bunch of fear. Don't, don't let anybody tell you that. It's wisdom, okay? It's wisdom. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, let's go to Genesis, the first chapter, and we'll start reading. Like I said, we're going to read a lot of scriptures. If you haven't read scriptures this week, if you haven't done all your Bible reading this week, we're going to catch up with you, okay? We're going to help you catch up. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth, verse 1 says. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the waters. Uh, my translation says the surface of the watery depth and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. It was an evening, and there was a morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water on the expanse from the water above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, evening came, and then morning the second day. Then God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth. Do you know that that word earth, eret, is, is an, a, another word that, they, that can be translated from earth in the Hebrew as delight? Remember that. That's, there, there's a hidden treasure in that. And God called the land delight, or earth, eret. A solid place is another another word, another way to translate a red out of the Hebrew. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth, let the delight produce vegetation, seed bearing plants, fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The delight produced vegetation, seed bearing plants according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky. And then the lights were created. Let's go down to... Um, Verse 20, then God said, let the water swarm with living creatures. God created all the, everything that flies and everything that swim, swims. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water. Verse 24, God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kind, living livestock, creatures that crawl and the wildlife of the earth according to their kind, and it was so. God made the wildlife of the, earth, of the earth according to their kind, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawled on the, on the ground according to their kind, and God saw that it was good. So then God, in verse 26, 27, said that um, God created man in his image and his likeness. A lot of people like to, to quote and like to confess that I am made in God's image 
And one of the responsibilities that we have to the earth, to our community, to our workplace, to our neighborhood, to cities, to nations, to states, to nations, one of the responsibilities is that we, we, need to be, we need to see that we were made after the image of God. But God didn't stop there. God didn't only say that we were made in His image. He said that He made you in His likeness. People not only have to see that you're made in His image, but I believe more importantly, they need to see that you're made in His likeness, that you are like God. God expects you to Show people what he is, what, what, what a father is like. I'm on this thing, I've been on this thing for years about fathers. I believe one of, one of the most important, if not the, I mean, I, I'll go ahead and take a leap of faith and put it out there. I believe the most important work that Jesus came to the earth to do was to reveal the heart of the Father to all people. Yeah, we know that He came to die for the sin of the world. We came for justification. He came for, you know, for our justification. So He came so that for our salvation. But I believe that the most important thing, because the disciple says, you know, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. And Jesus says, I've been with you all this time and you still don't recognize the Father. I believe that he came to show the heart of the Father. I was talking to a, a group of people that we met on Wednesday night at a house for a prayer meeting. And... Um, I mentioned a book that was written, oh gosh, I forget back in the 40s. You probably might, you might have already heard, uh, you might have already heard of the book, but never read it. I've read it. It's uh, and, and I forget the author. I'm sitting here trying to remember the author, and I can't remember the author. It doesn't matter. Um, but the title of the book was "Hands in the or, or Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." Good news for you, God. I have it on good authority. God's not angry. God's a good God. God is a loving Father. We need to rethink our, our, our uh, salvation message. What does is, what is salvation really look like? We are made in His image, but yet we're supposed to be like Him. Because we were also made in His likeness. People need to see. A dying world needs to A dying world doesn't need to know how dark they are. Uh, or how much darkness they're living in. They know how much darkness they're living in. They already know that. That's why there's a cry in their heart. Very, very, very few psychologists will tell you this. Very, very, very few people who are in prison for heinous crown, uh, uh, crimes against little children, of mass murder. Very, very, very few of them, if only just a handful of them throughout history, do not have any remorse. All these uh, world leaders that rose up to power that annihilated hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. People, my point is, People know they're in darkness. They need to see how good the Father is. We need to be walking with the same testimony that Jesus walked. I only say what I, what my, what I hear my Father say and I only do what, what I see my Father do. And then when I ask him, show us the Father, he said, listen, you've been with me all this time. I've been doing what I see the Father do. I've been saying what the Father says. I've been revealing you. To, I've been with you all this time and you still don't recognize the Father. That should be the question that you ask people. I am His likeness. I've already I've been working the next the next desk, desk over from you at work for five years, and you still don't recognize a father. 
Maybe you should be asking yourself that question. How come people don't recognize the Father in you? What are you showing about God? What are you showing to people about God? God is a loving Father. He's not an angry Father. He's not the abusive Father that took out the punishment of the world on His only Son. That's not what God is. And Jesus was not the big brother that got in between us and the angry Father. But we need to rethink these salvation messages. And the only way that you're going to change your definitions of salvation is you have to change your definition of loss. And we're going to be talking about these things in the next two lessons. What does it really mean to be lost? Let's keep reading in Genesis. Um, verse 27, chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. And he created them male and female. God blessed them, said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the, on the earth. Now, jump down to chapter number 2. Verse 4, these are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning this creation at the time that God made the earth and the heavens to no shrub of the field had yet grown on the land and no plant of the field had yet sprouted for the Lord God had not made rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. Jump down to verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden and in the east and there he placed a man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for fruit, for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now jump to verse number, I think it's verse 15. The Lord took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. You ever ask yourself this question? I've asked, I've asked it before. I don't claim to know the answer fully. I know one of the answers. Why would somebody that can just speak and something's creative will plant something? Why would God plant something? He has the authority to speak and it, it's created. So if you have the authority, put yourself in God's place. If you have the authority of, 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 of speaking and things are created, why would you plant something? Could it be maybe because he's into the maturity state or the maturity process? Could it be that, that that was what Jesus was talking about, the disciples, that we the, the chapter that we visited last week in John 15? Could it be that God is into the process of growing us up until you come to maturity? God planted a garden. God plants you. And God wants you to go through the process of maturity. Um, let's go to Romans, the 8th chapter. I'm going to read that out of the Passion Translation. Romans 8, one verse. Verse 19. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. Go to 2 Chronicle. Very familiar verse. If you've ever been to a uh, conference on prayer, it's not really a conference of prayer legally until this scripture was read. Second Chronicles 7. I already hear everybody saying 14. But I want to point something out. Let's start with verse 12. Solomon had just finished building the temple and he had made a petition and a prayer to God. 
And the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. If I shut the skies that there is no rain, or if, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people, and my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. I hope you, you're going to start seeing some kind of a, a theme here. Go with me to Psalm number 1. I told you we're going to read a lot of scriptures. I just want to lay, lay down the groundwork, and then we'll get into the meat of this teaching. We're not going to get to it, all of it, today, but we'll finish next week. I got one more today before Robert takes over for the month of August. Psalm 1, verse 1. Who delight, what delight comes to the one who follows God's ways? He won't walk in step with the wicked. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. Nor share the sinner's way, nor be found sitting in the scorner's seat. His pleasure and passion is remaining true to the word of I am. Meditating day and night in the true revelation of light. He will be standing firm like a flourishing tree. He will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design. Listen how he's um, describing these people who love God's word. You're planted, by, you're planted by God like a firm flourishing tree. I think one translation, I forget what translation I was reading, says that, that, that it calls, and it also says it in Isaiah. We might read it. If not today, next week. It says, it, it, it describes it as oaks of righteousness. So I'm going to read it that way. He will be standing, verse 3, he will be standing firm like oaks of righteousness planted by God's design. Here, here it is again. Why did God plant us? Because he wants us to go to the maturity stage. Deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of his life. He is never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, ever prosperous. I think um, King James and the New King James, and I think the New American Standard says it, that that uh, goes on to say that, the, that their leaf never withers. I like that translation because when it says that their leaf never withers means something. What does it mean? Well, Glad you asked. Go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22, two verses. Starting with verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Here's a river again. Flowing with water, clear as crystal, continuously pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The river was flowing in the middle of the street of the city, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of ripe fruit according to each month of the year. Here's where it talks about leaves. The leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. Now for many years we have been taught that that's in the millennium. We have been taught that that's when the new heavens and the new earth and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I disagree. Because it says that the two things. I'll point out the least. Psalms 1 we just read says that, the, that those that love God's word, that don't stand in the seat of scorn, of scorn and don't walk after the way of, of, of evildoers, that God will plant them by a river. And they will bear fruit in every season. It doesn't mean that you'll know that you won't have winter in your life. It's just that winter won't cause you not to bear fruit. We have to get this. We have to understand these things. God expects us to be fruitful. The teaching last week out of John 15 was that God wants us to bear more fruit. And the only way He's going to bear more fruit that we're going to bear, or, or that he makes sure that we bear more fruit, is that he's got to prune different ideas, different things. Remember, three weeks ago I said, I'm going to mess with some of your traditions. I'm going to mess with some of your way of thinking. 
how we have held on to traditions, to doctrines of men, to doctrines of, of theology, to doctrines of, of, of denominations, because that's the way my grandma always used to do it. And, that's how, and we want to honor, honor grandma and grandpa and my Aunt Sally and, and, and my Uncle Murphy and, and, you know, and, and, and my mother and dad, and that's how they believed and that's how they were raised and look how they turned out. Never mind that the Bible says that we are supposed to go from glory to glory. One generation is supposed to take it further than the previous generation. I thank God of the solid foundations that was laid when I first got saved at Yeoman's Baptist Church in Plant City. When I was invited to a church service and this crazy looking, charismatic, full of life, full of the Spirit of God preacher with a funny hairdo was preaching a message on how we raise our kids. How we feed them Frankenstein um, vitamins. Give them Count Chocula cereal. We need to rethink those things. What are we doing to our kids? And how God had healed them of diarrhea. That's the message he was preaching when I got saved. That word was full of life and it set me free that morning. Thank God for what Pastor um, Wayne Johnson taught me about repeating the sinner's prayer. He, he walked me through the steps of now you need to be baptized and he baptized me couple of Sunday nights later. Thank God for that. But if I really want to honor the memory of my fathers, the memory of the men that, that led me to God, that taught me the, 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 the biblical foundations that are in my life that I will never ever forget and they'll be with me until I go to my grave or Jesus comes back, whichever comes first. If I want to honor those memories, then I need to take this further. And we've always been told that this, this, uh, this chapter of 22 in Revelation is, 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 is it's about the, the, the great by and by when we all go to heaven. Well, then if it is, then how come it says that the leaves are for the healings of the nations? There'll be no one sick in heaven. There'll be no one sick in the middle. There'll be even no, no, no more tears. No one will die. In fact, um, let me write this one down. Isaiah 65 talks about how Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 15 talks about how the lion will lie it actually says that the, the wolf will lay down with the lamb and the child will stick his hand into the into the hole of the poisonous snake and not be harmed and and, and the lion will eat grass like a like a lamb does We've always been taught that that's about the millennium. That absolutely is not about the about the millennium. But when the you know Jesus comes back, new heaven, new earth, I can prove that to you. I just heard somebody ask me, prove that. Thank you. Thanks for asking. I will. Because it goes on to say that the centurion, the man who dies at a hundred years old, will be considered too young to die. Isaiah 65 teaches that. People are dying when the lamb is lying next to the lamb. When the little kid sticking his head into the hole of the snake and, and it won't harm them. People are dying. They're dying at older than 100 years of age. I believe that's something that is promised to us now a day. Before the new heaven and the new earth, because there will be no death, and people says they're dying, and if you die before you're a hundred, you'll be considered too young to die. We gotta rethink these things. I'm not wanting to. Not before I say that. Let's go to Isaiah. You should at some time do yourself a favor. Read Isaiah 61, 62, 63, 64, and 65. 
and take out the chapter separations. Read it like it's that's one continuous thought, one continuous revelation, one continuous prophecy, which it is, that God gave to Isaiah. We just happen to separate it in chapters and okay, I, I gotta read one chapter, so I gotta read chapter, I'm gonna read Isaiah 61 and then a week later we'll pick up, oh yeah, I, I finished, last week I finished, uh, I did Isaiah 61, so I gotta do Isaiah 62 this week. And because we read it previous week, we forgot what we re read, what Isaiah 61 was teaching us. So when we pick up the theme of Isaiah 62, we forget, okay, they're tied together. Same thing with 63, 64, 65. I think Isaiah only has 65 chapters, only 65 chapters. It's a big prophetic book. Next week we're going to talk about some of the prophecies that Isaiah gave and why. We're going to look historically why he gave those, prof uh, those prophecies and what it means to us nowadays in this age that we're living. I would love to read all of Isaiah 61. I don't know if I will or not, but let's get started with Isaiah 61.1. It's a great chapter that Jesus read when he was handed the scroll of Isaiah the prophet in his hometown in Nazareth on the Sabbath. This is the chapter that he rolled, the scroll, the, the, rolled out the scroll to. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and redeem, and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to provide to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Festive oil instead of mourning. And splendid clothes instead of despair. And they will be called righteous tree. There it is again. That righteous tree is the same righteous tree that uh, Psalm 1 was talking about. Oaks, oaks of righteousness. And they will be called oaks of righteousness planted by the Lord to glorify Him. God planted you so that you can glorify Him. John 15, we learned last week, he said that the, the way the Father is glorified is if He prunes you back and you become fruitful. And John 15, later on in the chapter, towards the end of the chapter, if not the end of the chapter, I believe it's at the end of the chapter of John 15, he says that you will ask anything in my... After he told you that he wants you to bear fruit, he prunes you so that you can bear more fruit, so that you can be more fruitful. Okay, define... What, what do you mean about fruitful? What is it about me, God, that when you look at me, you can say, that person is fruitful, other than that, that you cut some st stuff off of me, some tradition, some, some way of thinking that, 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 that you took away from me, some confessions that we made out of our mouth, some, some proclamations that didn't line up with the Word of God. Well, Jesus went on to say, in that day you shall ask anything in my name, and the Father will give it to you so that your joy may be full. We are designed that when we have answers to prayer, that when we get answers to prayer, our joy will be full. Joy is a reward. We are commanded to walk in joy. You want to call it happiness, that's fine. Um, Dennis Prater, if you ever get a chance to Google him, Dennis Prater does a great teaching on happiness is not a feeling. He had a professor at a college that, could, that asked him to come in and, and, and teach on happiness. And he, Dennis Prater asked him, because Dennis Prater is Jewish, he thought he might want him to come in and talk about the Jewish Messiah or about the Torah, whatever, because he was Jewish. He said, no, I want you to talk about happiness. Why happiness? Prater asked. But Prater asked, he says, it was, well, because that's an emotion that a lot of kids don't have. 
especially college kids. And Prager just it just rolled out of his mouth. He says, well, I believe happiness is not an emotion. It's a moral obligation. And the professor said, great title. So if you ever get a chance to listen to Dennis Prager, Prager University, on the teaching of happiness is not an emotion. Happiness is not a feeling. It's a moral obligation. We have a moral obligation to walk in happiness, to walk in the joy of the Lord. That's a moral obligation. You have a moral obligation to the person sitting next to you at work, your co-workers, your family. You have a moral obligation to walk in happiness and enjoy. Not to be this dried up prune all the time that's talking about doom and gloom. I've got news for you. All this doom and gloom things about the earth is going to pan, the blow, earth is going to blow away. I don't see that in scriptures until it gets better first. And that, I'm going to try to prove that to you in this session, the rest of this session, and then the session next, next week. That it's going to get better. I want to see the prophecy that's in the Bible where the knowledge of the, world, uh, uh, the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth like the sea covers the earth. Where the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdoms of the Lord and His Christ. Isaiah 61 is talking about these things. Listen to what we're going to do. First, He's going to take care of the ones... First, the anointed one, the anointing that was on Christ, is going to take care of the brokenhearted, the captives, the prisoners, those who mourn in Zion. And He's going to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, verse 3. Oil instead of mourning. He's going to clothe them instead of despair. Splendid clothes instead of despair. Now here's what's going to happen when, that, when we get a hold of this. There is a reason why you're in despair. There is a reason why you're in gloom. There is a reason why you are poor. Poor there doesn't mean that you don't have enough money. Poor means those that are desperate, those that are spiritually or living in spiritual poverty, let me put it that way. It has nothing to do with money. There's a reason for that. Because you're listening to the wrong person. You're listening to what the Bible calls the accuser of the brother. You're not just an old sinner saved by grace. We are the righteous of God. And God and the, the Bible says, we just read in Romans 8. The Bible says that all of creation is mourning until the sons and daughters of God be revealed. We have to know who we are. We have to come into our identity of who we are. You're not just an old sinner saved by grace. You weren't just, you weren't, you didn't, didn't just go down to an altar, repeat a prayer, and then now i got to endure all of life's trials and tests, and hopefully one day I'll make it to heaven. We're to be, the Bible, Paul says, we're to, we're to be more than conquerors. Isaiah 35 says that we are one of our responsibilities. Read Isaiah 35. I should have wrote it in my notes. I just thought about it. Isaiah 35 says that God wants to put you in the wilderness. Now, in our way of thinking, no one wants to go into a wilderness. Now, how are you doing, brother? I'm going through a wilderness. Well, what are you doing while you're in the wilderness? Isaiah 35 says that God puts us through the wilderness. God puts us through the valley of Baca, the, way, the, the valley of weeping. So that the springs will be flourishing again in the desert. That, that, that there will be crops and plants again in the wilderness. And there will be streams of righteousness that come. God wants you to put you in the wilderness so that you can make sure that the earth is producing what it's supposed to produce. The problem that we've had is that when we, when we study the story of creation, we always look... We always study the part that happened after the fall and we fail to study what happened 
before the fall. That's why I only read Genesis first chapter and the second chapter, parts of the second chapter. If we legally and adequately want to study the study of creation, we have to, and, and what God intended, we have to study what happened, what was happening, and what happened before the fall. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians when he talks about the first Adam and the second Adam. We have to study creation. We have to study Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. We have to study that in light of what the second Adam had done when he said to Telestai. What did he mean when he meant when he said to Telestai? What is it that he paid for? What is it that was paid in full? Did he say that just so you could one day walk down to an aisle, to, to, down an aisle, kneel at an altar, and say, and repeat a prayer? And now you've got your ticket and you're going to heaven? Thank God it started that way. I think that's a great way to start, but it's a poor way to, to end. You shouldn't stop there. We have responsibilities. And what we're talking about now, we have responsibilities to the earth. Prove that. Okay, I will. Verse 4, They will rebuild the, rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the former devastations. They will renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers will stand and feed your flock, and foreigners will be your plowmen and vine dressers, and you will be called the Lord's priest. They will speak of you as ministers of God. You will eat the wealth of the nations, and you will, you will boast in their riches. In place of your shame, you will have a double portion. In place of this grace, they will rejoice over their share. So they will possess double in their land an internal joy with will be theirs. A far cry from the earth is just going to get bad and bad and bad and just going to get worse and worse and worse. The Bible says we're, we're that that if we Psalm 91 there's three rivers that, 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 there's three times that a river is mentioned this river, more than more than three times but this particular river is mentioned three times throughout the whole Bible the first one was in the first one was in uh, um, Psalm 91 the second one was uh, the river that Ezekiel saw flowing out of the temple and then the one that we that um, we read about in Revelation 22. It's all the same river. And we need to make sure that we're planted. And we need to make sure that the seasons, if, if, if you have a mindset that your life is summer, spring, fall, and winter, you're not heavenly minded. You're not thinking from the God's perspective because in heaven there are no if you believe the prayer thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven in heaven there are no seasons we're studying the wrong things we study the fall we study creation but we fail to study what happened before the fall we we're so interested in what happened after the fall let me say this to you really going to rock you. 30 minutes after Adam fell, nothing happened. Nothing, nothing changed. 30 minutes after, nothing changed. Everything still looked the same. Other than that, they were covered with clothes. I understand all that. Thirty minutes after Jesus died on the cross, nothing changed in the physical. I know that it was noon, it was 3 o'clock, it was dark. I, I understand all that. Before the flood, everything was the same. They continued to marry before Sodom and Gomorrah was rained on. Everything was still the same. It's a progression of things that God shows us. 
40 days after the Passover lamb was slain, when Jesus, the perfect Passover, thing changed on the day of Pentecost. I'm sorry, I said 40 days, 50 days. God expects us to take His works from faith to faith, from glory to glory. The problem is that we've been studying the wrong thing. In Revelation, there's two women that are talked about. The great whore and the bride. And we've always looked, if we wanted to interpret, if we want to interpret, or try to find out, or try to estimate, I don't know if you've heard the latest date, September 23rd, 2030, Jesus is coming back. September 23rd, 2030, almost 10 years from now. You know what I'm doing to prepare for that day? I'm preparing a really good message for September 24th when Jesus doesn't come back. So we try to estimate. We try to discern the times and seasons of when Jesus is coming back and we're looking at the gray whore because we're saying that the, the, the world is getting nastier and nastier and that's, let me tell you something, the, the, the whore has always been nasty. It's just that more of her has been exposed nowadays because of modern technology and media and social media that we have. You're noticing more. It's always been nasty. I'm going to make a suggestion to you. Don't, don't be looking at the Lord. Look at the bride of Christ. Jesus says, I ain't coming back for a bride that is without spot and without blemish. Look at the bride. Look at the church. Don't look at the wrong things. For I, the Lord, love justice. Verse 8. I hate robbery and injustice. I will faithfully re reward my people and make a permanent covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and the pos posterity among the peoples. And all who see them will rejoice or will recognize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exalted my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and wrapped me in a rope of righteousness. As a groom wears a turban, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth produces its growth, and as a garden enables what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. I will not keep silent because of Zion, and I will not keep still because of Jerusalem until his righteousness shines like a bright light and her salvation like a flaming torch. Nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory and you will be given a new name and the Lord's mouth will announce you will be a glorious crown in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem in the palm of your God's hand. You will no longer be called deserted. Now listen to the, to the way he, uh, he puts this in order. You will, you will no longer be called deserted and your land will no longer be called desolate. Instead, you will be called my delight is in her, and your land married. And for the Lord delights in you, and your land will be married. Did you notice that? I've talked up to get to this point, this whole time to get to this point. The only way that the earth is going to be redeemed, the only way that the earth will produce what it's supposed to be producing, and that's why the earth, the earth knows that it's not producing the way it's supposed to produce, the way it was created for it to produce. And we read about it in Genesis, the first chapter. Go back and study it. Go back and study before what, what was happening before the fall. God says it will produce plants and those plants will have seeds in them that will yield more and more and more. Last week we talked about what God, God is into the more. The earth is mourning and, and groaning because it knows that it's being held back. It's being, it, 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 it's being hindered from producing what it was designed to produce. When Jesus calmed the storm, when the disciples went up and woke Him up and they said, don't you care that we die? He spoke to the wind. He rebuked, the Bible says He rebuked the wind. 
That word rebuke means that he, he actually told him, stop that. You weren't created to do that. The earth and the elements and the weather is waiting for us to speak to it. Again, study what happened before the fall. What was the weather like before the fall? I would like to suggest that the weather was like whatever Adam wanted it to be because he was in charge of all of that. And the earth is not yielding its abundance the way it was designed to do because we have not come to the realization of who we are. We are His delight. And, and, and Isaiah 62 says, you will no longer be called deserted and your land will not be called desolate. Your land is desolate. Your land is not producing because you consider your, yourself deserted. Next we will get into why we think we are deserted. We're listening to the wrong person. Just throw that out there. Instead, you will, again, listen, listen to the order. You will be called my delight, Hezbollah, not Hezbollah, but Hezbollah. And your land will be called married, Beulah. Grew up around the Baptist and, and, and Baptist revival and camp meetings and stuff. We always sang, you know, they always sang about Beulah, Beulah land, Beulah land. Beulah means married. We have to come to the understanding that we are loved by God and we are His delight. We don't run to the Father with our hat in our hand. Our hand, we do, but we should put it that way. A lot of us run to the Father with our hand in our, our, hat in our hand, our head bowed down with shame like the prodigal son approached the father and he said, Father, I am no word. I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. No word, no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like, and before he could say, make me like you, one of your servants, just hire me. Let me work myself back into your favor. The father stopped him. You can't work your way back into the father's love. You have to go, you have to that's why it's very, very important for you to go into the secret place. That's why, again, Pastor, Pastor Kevin stressed it in the sermon last week. I touched on it last week out of John 15. That's why prayer is so important. The intimate time with God where you recognize that I am a son of God and I am God's delight and God delights in me. And when, when, when we, we come into that identification of we are His delight, we are His beloved. We come into the understanding that we are loved. No matter how we, how we smell, we might smell like slop. And we might be covered with mud. God still loves us. You are His delight. And when we get that revelation, that's why the earth will come into... That's why it's groaning until you be revealed, until you recognize who you are. You're His delight. That's why it's important. And again, I don't mean to sound like a tree hugger and a squirrel kisser, because I'm not. But the whole, the Bible says, it goes on, and Roman goes on to say that all of creation is moaning. All of it. And groaning. And travailing. Like birth pains, Romans 8 says. Until we recognize who we are. In ending, let me read out of John 15. We were there last week. I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. This translation is a good translation of Passion, but it's so hard to read the verses. Let's start with verse 8, 15a. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. That's where maturity comes in, that you're bearing abundant fruit. I love, I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. 
You must continually, continually let me, let my love nourish your hearts. If you keep my commandments, you will live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments. For I continue, continually live nourished and empowered by His love. How do you bear abundant fruit? Come to the knowledge, come to the revelation that the Father loves you. He's not mad at you. He's not angry at you. He doesn't stand in judgment against you. He's not out there trying to, you know, just looking for every opportunity. Oh, I'm just I'm just waiting for when Robert slips and make a mistake and I don't want to punish him. He doesn't do that. He loves you. He loves you. And you need to come to that real, realization that Jesus loves you the same way that the Father loved him. That's awesome. That's what Isaiah 62 is talking about. We are His delight. The earth is His delight. Remember what I told you in the beginning? Eretz, the, the Hebrew word for, word, for, for earth, can also be translated delight. We're all His delight. But the earth will not meet her husband. Will not become Beulah land. Will not become His bride until we learn how to be his bride we might get into song of solomon next week great book to be reading when you want to get a revelation of how the bride responds to the husband i'm going to end it here we'll take up again next week god bless you hope to see you in church tomorrow or later on